Hello guys, welcome to netstrikers.com. My name is Aditya Dubey and in this video we are going to learn about the JVM architecture in a much simpler way. So often we have noticed this question in an interview that can you tell me something about the JVM architecture or how JVM works. We often fail to answer some time in an interview because we haven't prepared actually in-depth knowledge about the JVM architecture. Now, but in this tutorial we are going to cover up what is JVM all about, how JVM works and what are the internal components that are uh, there in the JVM. So let's get started. Now whenever we write our Java program, we use Java compiler to compile and to get the dot class file or the class file or the byte code as a output. But the JVM responsibility is to just load the class file and produce the output. That's it. This, that's a simple layman definition and you can just uh, prepare that. So JVM responsibility is just to load your application and execute your application. Now our application consists of dot class file which is a sub output that is being generated by the Java compiler. Now it is been loaded into first major component or the first major important component of the JVM which is the class loader subsystem. Now the class loader subsystem is responsible for loading your byte code and treating your byte code as an instruction, as an uh, as an input method or as an input argument that should be loaded and perform some operations with respect to other classes which are associated with the JVM. So for example, your collection classes, your system classes, your class classes and all the various types of classes which are there in the class loader subsystem which is provided by the JVM are taken care of. So by using the class loader subsystem, the class files are being loaded. But there are various certain uh, internal processing in the class loader subsystem which are three. So first phase is the loading, second phase is the linking and third phase is the initializing. Now loading is a phase where your class files are being loaded. Now basically loading involves three different kind of loader. The first one is the bootstrap loader. The second one is the uh, application class loader. The third one is the extension loader. Now we are going to look forward to each of them one by one. Let's get started with the bootstrap loader which is very common question in an interview. Now bootstrap loader is responsible for loading your internal Java class files which are there in the file called rt.jar. You often encounter the rt.jar file in your Java directory which consists of all the important classes and important packages which are there in the which are required by the Java. All the primary packages and all the primary classes are uh, there in the rt.jar file. Now the second class loading system is the extension class type loader. Now the extension class loader is responsible for loading up the important extensible file or extra files which are needed by the JVM or the classes which are required by the JVM for uh, uh, further processing. So it is basically in uh, I guess it's in the uh, lib slash ext directory. So lib slash ext contain all the extension classes which are loaded after the bootstrap loader. Now after the uh, uh, extension class has been loaded successfully, there is third important thing which is loaded called as class path, application class path. Now application class path are specified with the CP parameter or I can say minus CP parameter. This basically loads your uh, special classes which are uh, supplied by the compile time or at the run time which are needed by the compile time at or at the run time. So you can explicitly supply this parameter command which is minus cp or you can load these class path in your environment variable as well. So the loading phase is over. Now let's back to the second phase important phase called as linking. Now linking is the phase where most of the work has been done. Now linking involves three sub process which is verifying, prepare and resolving. Verify phase is a phase where your Java byte code is uh, taken care of. It basically check byte code that whether it is compatible to the JVM specification or not. So if there is a certain uh, problem while verifying the Java byte code, it will throw us in common error which is class not found exception which happens during the verifying phase. Now the second phase is the prepare phase. Now in the prepare phase, 
all the class data variable or the instance variable are being initialized to their default value for example if i have a variable called as public static boolean uh, uh, something equals to true so in the prepare phase it uh, the something variable which is of boolean type of static will be initialized to the default value of boolean type which is false not true because prepare phase involves initializing with the default value not with the original value now after the preparing phase we have the resolve phase now resolve phase uh, task is to uh, load the uh, another uh, another associated class which are there in the uh, main uh, class for example all the references variables or the references objects are initialized during the resolve phase now for example you have a class called as a uh, bike now bike can consist of another class or variable called as owner now during the resolve phase the bike class will going to check whether there is a definition for owner or not so if there is a definition then there is no problem it will going to continue evolve again and again but if it fail to uh, find the class or the another class called as owner it will go and throw us an error or exception called as class def not found exception which is a very common in interview questions nowadays now after the resolve phase the third phase comes into play which is the initialization now initialization is a phase where your uh, uh, static initialization block uh, initialized first and after that all the values which we uh, assigned in the prepare phase for example uh, in the prepare phase we have assigned something variable to as uh, false which is the default value of course are initialized to the actual value for example as i discussed in the prepare phase we have public static boolean something is initialized with false now in the initialization phase it will be initialized at public static boolean something to true which is the actual value in the initializing phase so that's how class loader subsystem works actually in a much simpler way now there is some another component which is called as runtime data area which comprises of all the memories which are going to be utilized by the jvm itself now let's encounter the method area first now method area is an runtime data access area where which responsibility is to load your class data or the metadata which is correspond to class all the data which present or which correspond to the class will get stored in the method area basically the method area size is 64 megabyte by default but it can be tuned up by using uh, permgen command or there is a command which i am going to discuss in our next video but uh, this can be tuned up by using xpermgen xs or xmx command so for example if you load if your server load the thousands and thousands of class or example millions of classes now there may be a probability that you will get a java lang out of memory error this is due to the uh, exceed in the size of the memory utilization so you can tune up by using xx xmx and uh, using the permgen and uh, permgen uh, uh, well now in when you talk about the java 8 now permgen is been uh, replaced by using metaspace what the what java developer of 8 did as they do not need any kind of uh, uh, external developer uh, input to tune up the method area space what they did is they introduced the meta space now meta space is responsible for automatically memory allocation of expansion as well as uh, shrinking so that's all about the method area now heap now heap is the heavy used memory memory area in jvm so he basically store all the object data for example whenever you instantiate a new object called as my app app equals to new my app now all the data all all the object which are going to be created will be there in the heap memory only all the properties all the characteristics all the attributes of the object will get stored in the heap for example you can store array since arrays are also object so all the objects are get stored in the heap by default heap memory is 1/4 of the physical memory but this can also be tuned up using xx command and uh, for the xs for the small size and xmx for the maximum size so this can be tuned up by using this parameter command now here comes the picture of java stack now java stack contains stack frame 
it is basically per method invocation the task of the java stacks is to load up the method and uh, invoke the method based on the preference or based on the last in first out preference now we often call the method one by one so for example if if one thread is calling method one now method one is calling method two so m1 will stack first then m2 will come into the picture and then m3 will come to the picture now this will be popped up based on the uh, returning occurrence and we don't need to worry about that because they are going to return anyway now there is sometimes sometimes there occurs that java stack has been uh, stacked up again and again what happen actually is whenever you wrote a program and uh, there is a recursive algorithm that is not encountered while uh, handling by the developer so there occur the stack frame added again and again and again because of the developer fault so there may occur stack overflow exception now this can also be tuned up uh, you can tune your java stack frame size uh, i guess there is a command called xs again which is used to uh, change the size of the java stack frame now basically it, uh, you don't need to worry because this is automatically cared up by the jvm itself so you don't need to worry about that now here comes the fourth picture of the J Java uh, PC registers. PC registers are basically program counter registers which uh, basically pointer to the next instruction to be executed and the PC register is responsible for uh, per thread management and suppose there are three thread 1, thread 2, thread 3. Uh, thread 1 uh, counts the instruction for the thread 2, thread 2 counts the instruction for the thread 3 and basically it's a pointer to the next instruction to be executed. Now here comes the fifth important stack which is the native method stack which works parallelly with the java stack. Now java ma native method stacks is basically uh, the operating system dependent. All the uh, operating system, native operating system dependent classes are loaded into this native method stacks. For example, there is uh, libraries in the uh, lib folder called as DLLs. There are a lot of DLL available if you are using Windows. Now DLL is responsible for holding up your class data corresponding to the operating system dependency. Now if, <coughs> sorry, if you are using Windows, then there is uh, .dll file. If you are using Linux or Unix, there may be probability that you will find .so or .a kind of file extension. Now these all belong to the native method stack. Now here comes the third most important execution block or the component which is called as the execution engine. Now execution engine is responsible for executing a bytecode instruction. It basically comprises of various subsystems which are interpreter, garbage collection, uh, just in time compiler and uh, there is something uh, more called as hotspot profiler. Now interpreter. Uh, interprets the bytecode instruction line by line it checks whether the uh, bytecode instructions are compatible to execution engine or not and it passes using the native method interface and he helps in the execution now here comes the picture of JIT compiler which is just in time compiler uh, whenever execution engine encounter the similar kind of inter uh, uh, instruction to be executed again and again so what it does, it compiles, JIT compiles the uh, some sort of uh, some piece of uh, classes or some piece of code. It compiles some part of code which is repeated over and again so that it can improve the performance in the later time. For example, there is a ABC, ABC, ABC encounter again and again and again. The ABC is actually an instruction. Now what JIT does, JIT pre-compiles automatically ABC. Now whenever in the next instruction ABC encounter JVM reduces that time and this thus this this leap leads to the performance uh, improvisation. So JIT is basically this only. Now here comes the picture of uh, the hotspot profiler. Now hotspot profiler keeps an eye on the bytecode and it helps the J, uh, JIT compiler to uh, basically looks for the statistics and it provides the statistics results which are uh, instruction which are repeated over and over again now that's all about the jvm architecture all about i hope you liked it if you have any suggestions or doubt please do let me ask in the youtube comment section this is the first time which i am recording tutorial in this way so thank you for now i hope you liked it 
if you have any suggestions or doubt please do let me ask in the youtube comment section your suggestions are always welcome until then enjoy life bye bye happy coding